Hi everyone and welcome to Vikings Now and your Minnesota Vikings are now 2-0 on the season. Jim Rich along with Pierre Nujum and Amat. Oh, he missed another one. He's a busy man. He's a busy, He's man. busy. He was at the stadium. He, he would have brought just some great insight, but somehow he missed the memo. But the Vikings did not miss their opportunity. Mm -hmm. They came through with a sensational performance you have to say this two weeks in a row that this vikings football team has exceeded everyone's expectations what do you take away as the headline i think it's the same as last week and when we were talking about complimentary football you saw this team today turn the ball over at inopportune times and saw the defense step up you saw the defense allow a touchdown and the and the offense would respond with a big drive late in the first fourth quarter to kick that field goal to go up 23 to 14 at the time converted several third down opportunities on that drive i believe it was three third down opportunities on that drive if i'm not mistaken that were converted that allowed them to make it a two possession game late and really kind of put the game away seemingly at the time and it really felt like the game was put away once that field goal went through the uprights to make it 23-14 but it's complimentary football two weeks in a row Jim and how can you really argue with the results and on top of it too I, I don't the Vikings didn't play their best game today again turning the ball over a couple times in the red zone right but in reality this game was a lot closer than it really should have been Minnesota had an opportunity to really put this game away they yeah, turned the ball over the Aaron interception Jones, did he not fumble yep, that one the interception in the red zone by, by Sam Darnold and then the fumble by Aaron Jones this game could have easily been a two touchdown victory or at least a 10 point victory in my eyes for Minnesota had they not turned the ball over in the red zone and on top of that after they blocked that punt yep they only got three out of that Correct. they could have picked up another seven there right absolutely so I mean the the Vikings didn't play their best football against a team that many consider to be the favorite to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl again and they come out with a win and like we were saying last week something in the water here in Minnesota that the Niners don't like again they do not win in Minnesota that streak going all the way back to 1992 so uh, Minnesota getting it done once again against the Niners here at US Bank Stadium all right, I got to give a tip of the hat to the coaching staff. They Without came question. up with unique plays, both defensively, the scheme to rattle Purdy and try to make sure that he again would be the guy with the ball in his hands. Because San Francisco have so many playmakers, you want to obviously make him be the guy that has the ball in his hands. And two, O'Connell having the confidence in Sam Bradford to let him throw out of his own end zone and hook up with that 97 yard bomb to Justin Jefferson. I think both of those show that these coaches, both Flores and O'Connell, who let's, okay, Wes Phillips is the offensive coordinator. Okay, yeah, sure. it's like, here, yeah. here you yeah. go, Wes, read these is what O'Connell's doing. And the way those two consistently come up with some different angle to attack their opponents with, uh, has really paid dividends and shown that these two are telling these players that I believe in you. You can get this done. We're giving you the opportunity because we feel you have the talent to do the job. It's only been two games, but I think you're already starting to see the identity of this team form. It's a team that on paper, or I should say, after two complete games and two tapes, tape worth of games, we see a team that likes to run the football, can run it effectively, whether it's Ty Chandler or whether it's Aaron Jones, a team that plays great defense, and a team that doesn't really ask too much of his quarterback. And I'm not even going to sit here and call Sam Darnold a game manager because he hasn't played like a game manager in the first two games. He has made the plays that have allowed them to move the ball down the field and put them in position to win. It's been a lot more than just a game manager role. The 97-yard touchdown bomb yes, to Justin that's Jefferson. That's not a game today, manager no, throw. That was right on the money. Right on the money to Justin Jefferson. I know Justin Jefferson uh, let his, reg his legs do the rest of the work after that. But um, Sam Darnold has played well. Again, the turnovers, uh, we saw one last week. His arm was hit as he threw last week against the Giants. A great play by Fred Warner today on that interception. That was really a fantastic play by an all-pro type talent in Fred Warner. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect. But it's not bad by any means. It's enough to be 2-0. and That's all you can ask for after two weeks, and the Vikings are certainly just that. Yeah, Darnold, what he did again today. And, you know, game managers are the product of the head coach, mm -hmm. 
right? Uh, I mean, there are some guys that really just don't have the attributes, sure. like Malik Willis over in Green Bay today. They just ran the ball as much as humanly possible. And we've had plenty of situations here with the Vikings over the years where they've had to just manage the game. Malik so, had to run the ball with the with puke all over it once yes. in today's game. Goodness yes. gracious. Still yes. got to do, you have to, to find done. that clip. If you have not found it yet, <laughs> it is one of the most amazing things I have ever seen where the Packers center, as soon as they go to snap the ball, vomits profusely mm -hmm. all over the football. And then instead of just falling on it and being a guy like, if I did that, I just fall on it and we'll take another down. No, he snaps it. And Malik has got this football that's dripping with puke. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, what am I supposed to do with it? So he just ran with it. And then afterwards, the game, the Packers head coach, Lafleur was asked about the play, saying, well, why didn't you have him throw the ball? And he said, well, this is the best excuse I've ever heard. Right. Uh, Malik told me that the center just puked all over the ball and he was afraid to throw it because it would slip out of his hand. We call that the presence of mind <laughs> to, to, to at least make a play. And Malik Willis was able to do just that. Kudos to him. But I hope he washed his hands after today's game. That's certainly what I would have done immediately. I want to know how the center had enough strength to actually make a block. Yeah, kudos because to him as well. When, when I, uh, you know, lose the lunch, mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of strength no. left in you. No, <laughs> you know no. that's that, that's power of God. I, I, know, I know now we've completely veered off the rails yes, here right. on the Vikings. Down circle podcast, back, circle know. back. Let's that's get back to Darnold. Enough Here's his numbers: 17 to 26, 268. So 97 came on one of those pass plays. Mm -hmm. So the other 16 were, you know, pretty tight in within range. He was sacked three times, but his quarterback rating for the day, 109.1. And we still have to point out, no Jordan Addison today. It, it doesn't seem likely. We don't know just yet, but it doesn't seem likely that Jordan Addison is going to be ready for next week either. It, he may progress well throughout practice, but with those high ankle sprains, I mean, those, those tend to take more than just a week, but we'll see. Perhaps Jordan Addison will be back. I'm not terribly optimistic about that happening in week three when the Houston Texans come to town. So no Jordan Addison, no TJ Hawkinson. So you're missing two big pieces of your offense, especially in the past game, but he's still finding a way to get it done. Don't turn the ball over again. He did that once, but you know, it, those things are going to happen, but I, I still think he went out and, and did the job that he was asked to do at, at no point throughout these first two games. Have we sat here and thought to ourselves, boy, Sam Darnold's really holding this team back. That yeah, has not no. happened one time, nope, not nope. one time, not one time. And if anything, Sam Darnold is showing us, you know, we, I know you and I talked about this last week. Sam Darnold is showing us that perhaps he is worthy of a starting job moving forward past this year. He's only on a one year deal here in Minnesota and he's showcasing himself because he wants to continue his career as a starter in the NFL if he can. And he's doing that so far through two games. And on uh, Vikings fan line on K fan radio, they were talking about they're actually getting calls from fans saying, we should re-sign Darnold right now. Well, I, I mean, I, well, I mean, this is what I would say. This is what I would say to that. I mean, you're not, not saying that's preposterous. No, I'm not not at all. How? I mean, do you think the Miami Dolphins would like to have Sam Darnold right now as their backup quarterback if that was an option for them? I mean, that you, you Green can't. Green Bay Packers. What? I mean, J.J. McCarthy. Green Bay Packers. Another example. J.J. McCarthy is going to be coming off knee surgery. We don't know how good he will be or how effective he will be when he comes back. I'm sure he'll be just fine. But at the same time, too, what if he gets hurt again? Then what do you do? Uh, so, uh, it, Sam Darnold is probably not going to accept a backup role, especially if he continues having the year that he's having so far. He's not going to accept a backup role. He's going to be looking for a bigger payday. So I don't really see that happening here. But at the same time, I can certainly understand why the fans would want to keep him around for how, insurance. How, how about this? How about this? You say to him, we will pay you now, right? Not the highest paid quarterback like Love, but you give him a bump. Uh -huh. You give him a raise, and it's like a two-year, like a bridge deal. Mm -hmm. And then you have the option next year, or if you think McCarthy's ready to go, you trade him on draft night. Because this way, he's going to be a free agent. He walks away. You get nothing right. for him. Right. So maybe, I mean, Quasi Adolfo Mensa, he's a, he's, a, he's a Wall Street guy. So he can buy a stock while it's low. Yeah, sure. And then turn around and sell that stock high. I, I and have. he can watch it grow. He can sign him right now. If you told, if you were Sam Darnold and you told Sam Darnold, I will give you $20 million, what 25 million 
each of the next two years. So we rip up your $10 million deal now. We bump you up 15 more this year. Mm -hmm. We give you 25 for next year with an option. Well, this is what I would say to that. Uh, you drafted J.J. McCarthy 10th overall for a reason to be the future. You want to see what he can do. And you're not going to be paying a backup quarterback $25 million a year, are you? You're not going to have your salary right, but, cap but you dedicated. just said, you I, I, said Miami would be knocking at your door. Green Bay would be knocking yeah. at your door. This is a league where quarterbacks all of a sudden become – a necessity yeah. and all of a sudden people do crazy things like last year the Vikings were scrambling all over trying to find a body they were able to bring in uh, Josh Dobbs you know if you're a good football team mm -hmm. and you don't have the insurance policy yeah maybe, maybe this maybe this is a way because if Darnold continues to have a great year and the Vikings are going to be left holding nothing and then you have McCarthy which you don't know is going to what he's going to be like until week one of next year because he's not going to play in the preseason. You're not going to have a real handle on things. Right. It sounds I, I like can, what I can it see sounds, the comments right now. Well, Jim is a moron. What it, what it sounds <laughs> let me, like. Let to me, me type it in no, and put it in already. No. What it sounds like to me is you have the topic of conversation that you want to discuss with Quasi Dofamenso when he holds his uh, midseason meeting with the media. It sounds like you have a topic. Of you got to sign him before then. Well, because if he rolls, then it is going to get too ridiculous. I, I, I understand both sides of the coin here, uh, but uh, listen, it's again, it's two games. Who knows what might happen by by the end of the year. I don't know if you want to jump the gun already right now to do it, but I mean, it's, it's certainly he's Sam Darnold certainly proving that he can get the job done when called upon. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you could comment. We'll see him all on the uh, YouTube stream. That's a place to see it. Uh, you could hit him on what? What's your uh, X handle? Don't physically hit me, please. At least <laughs> not yet. But I'm, uh, yeah, on X, you can find me at the Nuge Fox 9. That's where you can find me. All right. And this show is also on Fox Local. You can see it there. You can see it on the Fox 9 website. So wherever you find it, keep finding it. Tell us uh, that we're wrong. Tell us we're right. Tell us, wow, that was a great idea, Jim. Tell us that was a terrible idea. How about Jalen Naylor? Yeah. What did you like him? Can he be a two going forward if you're feeling that uh, Addison is going to be on the shelf we, longer? We talked about it last week. Opportunity was opportunity was knocking for Jalen Naylor. And what did he do? He walked right through the door. Three catches, 54 yards, a touchdown today. Second straight week with a touchdown for Jalen Naylor. Again, a guy who is looking like a guy you can depend on. They let K.J. Osborne walk in free agency. He was a good safety valve for the quarterbacks that were here over the last couple of years. He walks in free agency, goes to New England. Jalen Naylor injured throughout the majority of his first couple of years here in Minnesota. We didn't really get a chance to see what he can do. They call him speedy for a reason. Yeah. The guy's got wheels. He can run, but can he be a complete wide receiver? We saw that a little bit last week. We saw it again this week. And yeah, I think I've seen enough from Jalen Naylor to make me think that if Jordan Addison misses next week against Houston, it's not going to be the end of the world. Jordan Addison, I think, is probably a better talent overall than Jalen Naylor and a little more vital piece to the offense. But in this situation, the drop-off right now doesn't appear to be as much as many might think with Jalen Naylor, again, who we were singing his praises all throughout Vikings training camp and today going out and proving that he can be a guy who can be dependent on. Remember, Justin Jefferson left the game here to, uh, yep. today with a quad injury. We'll so talk they, about that in a minute. They were down to their third, fourth, and fifth, uh, fifth wide receiver in today's game. Brandon Powell made a couple of nice catches on that in the drive in the fourth quarter that allowed them to go up 23-14. So, uh, yeah. That, that was perhaps the most critical drive of the I, game. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. And, and I honestly, I feel like I could spend the entire podcast talking about that drive alone because the Niners were starting to breathe down your neck. They closed the gap to within six. You got to come out and show that you can win a ball game when the opportunity is handed to you. Exactly. And and they that's something that this team has not in right. the past not been able to finish a lot of these games. And it brings me back to what we said off the top. The third down conversions on that drive was absolutely instrumental. Third and seven, third and eight. There was another third and short conversion, conversion, conversion. Go out and show me that you can rise to the occasion when the game is essentially on the line. They took nearly seven minutes off the clock on that drive, already up six. 
then kick the field goal and leave San Francisco with very little time to try to get back in this game where you're down two scores. I absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more that that was really a telling drive for this Vikings offense. Is that drive of the game tonight? Stay, stay, a Vikings post game tonight? Stay at tuned. 1035, Pete Bursich joins us. Stay tuned. We got plenty of great options to choose from. I know that there was one drive that only had one play that was pretty electric. <laughs> That's probably going to be up for discussion, but that, that drive right there really showed me a lot from the Vikings offense. And the thing about Naylor, my favorite play of his was on that Jefferson touchdown. He didn't give up when he saw right. the catch made. Right. He went all the way, ran all the way, and threw a block at the very end so Jefferson could get into the corner because I think he would have been caught. I think at he was starting to uh, inhale a lot of oxygen as he was getting close to that goal line. Effort always counts for something. And, you know, Jalen Naylor, like we just said, I mean, he, he hasn't had many opportunities over the last couple of years. A lot of that has been injury-related. But when you put that on tape, when the Vikings coaching staff goes back and puts that, that play on tape, as I'm sure they're going to do tomorrow, and show the entire team, that's one thing that's going to stand on tape. You never give up on a play because you never know what might happen. Who knows? What if the ball gets punched out of Justin Jefferson's hands and no one's there to possibly try to fall on it? You never give up on a play Ever, and that's a perfect example. Well, or if Jefferson gets tackled and they don't get in and they only settle for three. Sure. You know, there's so many things that could happen. Plus, you have to give kudos to the officials, too. Watch it back. Those <laughs> yeah, guys. That was another hustle play. I think there'd be some teams saying, man, did that guy uh, play before? Because yeah, uh, it yeah. was unbelievable. The back judge uh, basically passed everybody to get down there to make the call on the day. All right. But so if Naylor is your number two like he was today, uh, Trent Sherfield, yeah. one catch, Powell, a couple of catches, Johnny Munt, you know, whatever. Uh, can this team survive, or is it a chance for the Vikings if, again, this is Addison, and we're just speculating because that's what we like to do, uh, if he is gone for, say, another couple of weeks, mm -hmm. do you decide that we have to go look and see what's on the street? and bring in another veteran because there are guys out there that have not gotten deals as of yet. Yeah, if Jefferson is hurt enough to the point where he can't play next week. Or he's week, questionable. Yeah. Well, yeah, if he's if he doesn't go, for sure you yeah, have to go yeah. buy a new body. Yeah, we're, we're not ready to say that yet. We're going to wait for the first injury report to come out on Wednesday. I'm sure Kevin O'Connell will update everybody tomorrow when he has his opportunity to meet with the media. But to answer the question, yeah, I think they can get by, and I'll tell you why. Because... Today, again, we saw another terrific running performance from the Vikings offense. It wasn't Aaron Jones per se, yep. even though he was involved in the passing game as well. Ty Chandler running the ball effectively. As a team, the Vikings averaged over six yards a carry today. If you can do that consistently, then I think it takes a lot of pressure off of not just your wide receivers, but who the wide receivers are. Because Aaron Jones caught five passes on the day, didn't have the best day running the football. But Ty Chandler, 10 carries, 82 yards on the day. A, I don't, you know, I hate to sound cliche, a thunder lightning duo. I don't know if it's going to be exactly <laughs> right, that between, right. between Let's Jones go a little far. And, and Chandler. We're in week but, two. But, 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 but this is, hey, I, I have seen enough from Ty Chandler to make me think he's not just a guy, not just an average guy. The guy has shown me time and again that when he puts his hands on the football, he's capable of, you know, yeah, he doesn't have maybe elite speed in the NFL, right. but he runs hard. His legs don't stop moving. He runs through contact. He can be relied on out of the pass game. And the Vikings have two very capable running backs. And when you have that, I think it opens up your playbook more, takes pressure off the wide receivers. Of course, I hope that Jordan Addison is back Takes pressure off Darnold, too. Without question. Because so, then you're not sitting there at right. second and nine, no doubt. second and 11. No doubt. And, and, that's, and that's what you want. And to answer your question, yeah, I think they can survive. Yes, I can. All right. I, I do think so, yes. And this is now five straight games, if you count the preseason for whatever you want to count those for, that this team has rushed for over 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So that has been a point of emphasis since uh, basically OTAs. That was something that just didn't pop into their head two weeks ago. And they go, you know what? We should try to run the ball more this year. No, I think the Vikings saw enough of that disappointment last year when they couldn't convert short yards situations we've had Pete in here hammering on that fact that yeah. you need positive yards every time you run the ball you cannot have situations where you're losing yards and all of a sudden it's second and 11 and we saw that a lot last year with the Vikings so I think this was a point of emphasis and it's a message that has gotten home to the offensive line 
to the running backs mm -hmm. and, and the wide receivers as well. They've been holding up their end on the blocking as well when they're asked to be a part of it. And that goes into our discussion earlier in the podcast. Where we're talking about this team forming an identity. And it seems like they're starting to do that right now and running the football seems to be part of what they want their identity to be. And I think that's very, very important when you consider what we saw last year. No disrespect to Alexander Madison, but he did not get the job done. This Vikings run offense was anemic last year, and that really led them to be a kind of one-dimensional offense. Of course, losing Kirk Cousins didn't help, of course, last year, but uh, a very encouraging sign so far from the Vikings run game. We'll see if we can continue next week. Against well, Houston. you're talking about a balanced attack. Yeah. Right? We're not living just on Justin Jefferson's legs. We're not running on just Aaron Jones. We're a balanced team. And today, 17 first downs, nine came via the rush, eight came via the pass. Mm -hmm. So you were seven of 12 on third down versus the Niners, two of 10. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. is that's something that you can hang your hat on. That's something that's sustainable, right? Because that was yeah. our big question coming out of the Giants game. Is this sustainable? Hey, it was a great win. You beat them by 22. Good right. for you. But can you do it again? Can you do it again? And this formula seems like it is sustainable. It, it is, and we've talked an awful lot about the Vikings offense, but this Vikings defense today was just absolutely – Right, spectacular. But, uh, spectacular. Uh, I was looking for a comment, though. Is this sustainable, this offense, in your mind? The way it um, is run right now. So I feel that yeah. this seems like a sustainable blueprint moving forward. Well, so answer that, then we'll go to the defense. Sustainable, yes, but I want to see a little bit more because even though they won by 22 last week, remember, seven of those points came via defense. So Correct. 21 points from the Vikings offense last week, 23 points today. 20, that, that 21, 23, 24 range – it's enough for you to win ball games, but it's not enough for you to feel comfortable. So if we could get to 27, then I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable about that. I'm not saying they're going to go out and average 27 every week, but if you can get to 27, that's when I'm starting to feel a little bit more comfortable. If you're stuck in that 20 to 24 range, you're not exactly putting yourself in a sure position to win ball games. So sustainable, yes, okay. but... I think it needs to get to another gear in order for me to feel fully comfortable with it. Well, and that goes to the next point because time of possession. Niners had the ball almost 35 minutes of this game. Mm -hmm. Vikings only 25. That's where the offense has got to keep it going. Yeah. Because they were getting tired in that game, especially going into halftime. There was uh, Ben Lieber on the sidelines. I was listening to the radio call, mm -hmm. and he was talking about Ivan Pace Jr. missed a couple of tackles. And he said that the doors were open and it was very humid in there and hot and the defense was on the field too long. And then you started the second half with a three and out yeah. and gave it right to the Niners again. That's where the defense had to suck it up and they did turn them back. So the sustainability of this blueprint for the offense, it also has to work in time of possession. It, it does. I, I, I feel time of possession is is a little bit of an overrated stat. And I only say that. What? Because, yeah, I feel like it's what? an overrated stat because it, it doesn't matter. It, it's 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 black and white. It, but 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 we are about here, especially at Fox Nine. We are about <laughs> quality, not quantity. So it all depends on what you do when you have the football. And the Vikings were able to show what they could do when they had the football. Yeah, sure. I mean, I would love for them to control the clock a little bit more and have more opportunities and more drive opportunities to put points on the board. But they did what they had. To, I mean, look, look, the Niners had the ball, like you said, for almost 35 minutes. What did they do? The Vikings turned them turn away at the goal line once. Yeah. And a big, big uh, moment of the game. Uh, so it's I, – I, I'm not as worried about time of possession. If, if you want to give yourself more opportunities to have the ball in your hands to score, I get it. Well, the, but, f the fourth downs yeah, is where the defense one, really stepped well, up. Yeah, they were one of three. Nine, yeah, the Niners, Niners were one, one three. for three. Yep. Vikings one of three on, on fourth down, two of ten, like you said, on third down. So – that, that's really the telltale difference in the game for me. And, and like I was saying, what, how many sacks did the Vikings have? Six? Six sacks, one interception, one fumble recovery, a block punt. Again, I, I, I have been saying it since the man walked in the door here. Brian Flores knows how to run a defense, arguably better than perhaps anybody in the National Football Don't League Don't cut right Matt now. Daniels short. No. He, got, he got the block Well, punt. yeah, Matt Daniels. He gets full credit <laughs> for me on that. He full credit for me on that, Matt, if you're watching. But, yeah, Brian Flores. Well, he does. He, he, uh, yeah, I, I know see his comment right there. Yeah, you can I'm see sure. it. You yeah. can see it going by right now. Yeah, yeah, but, but Brian Flores, once again, and, and there's no real – 
star on this? I mean, can you think of a guy that's a real that's a star on Van this Ginko defense has right been now? Something Van pretty Ginko, um, Andrew Van amazing. Ginkle has been great. They paid. He almost Johnny. had another pick six today. Uh, uh, the yes, same he did. play. Yes, he he read, yes, he read that play with like 450 left and almost walked in with another one. Jonathan Grenard is the guy who got the money. He had a sack today. Patrick Jones, for the second straight week, had two sacks in a game. He's got four sacks in two games. Patrick Jones was taken, I believe, in the fourth round a few years ago here. Never really seemed to find his footing. But suddenly, with Brian Flores at the helm, he saw something in a young man and found a way to turn him loose and get him going. And now look at him now. I mean, we talked about this during the offseason. How were the Vikings going to supplement the sack production from Daniil Hunter? It doesn't have to necessarily be one guy. And they're showing exactly that. It's a team collective effort. Patrick Jones has four total sacks through two games. We saw Harrison Phillips with a sack last week. We saw Andrew Van Ginkle with a sack today. Jonathan Grenard with a sack today. Cashman. So, yeah, Cashman, Cashman, Cashman led the team in tackles today. So this, it, it doesn't really seem to matter who's back there defensively. As long as Brian Flores is running this defense, I, he has full faith and confidence for me. Uh, I, I trust the man to get it done on a week in and week out basis. And I think a, a key in the acquisitions that the Vikings brought in via free agency to bolster this defense, Van Ginkle was talking about this going into the San Francisco game and people were talking about, well, geez, you get the pick six, you're back in coverage, you're all over the place. He goes, I just don't know my position. I know all the positions. Right. And he says, we have guys here that understand everything, that aren't guys that just know I go from here to there. That's all I do is go here to for there. Mm -hmm. And that we have people that can do it all so then we can change it up. Like where you're saying, you don't know which one's going to get the, the big day. Is it going to be Patrick Jones? Where did Patrick Jones come from? Did anybody think he was going to be a defensive star on this Vikings team? But because you have so many players that can switch, Offenses have to look at and they'll see, you know, we've seen it, right? They get eight guys on the line and only four come. <laughs> Everybody else hightails it out of there or they all come. And so I think that deception, but the knowledge that the players have like Gilmore, like Harrison Smith, like Shaq Griffin, they know all these intricacies because they've been around Flores. And so they know what he's asking. I think Flores started this year instead of at this level. He was able to go, okay, boys, we already got this base down. Mm -hmm. Let's go up here and let's have some fun with this. And I think sure. for the first couple of weeks, everybody's enjoying playing this defense. You know, if I could have an old man moment of myself, uh, if, to myself here. I, I got I, plenty I would, of them to share. Well, I, I would say, you know, I've never been a fan of people who say, well, that's not my job. You know, at, at, at a, whatever, whatever it is you do, when you say, well, that's not really my job. Well, it's not really the job of a safety to perhaps know what the defensive tackle is doing vice versa now when you have everybody on the same page if you learn what other people do that eventually affects you as a unit as a group and you gain an appreciation and a knowledge for what they do and how it might affect you individually and you as a whole then suddenly you've got yourself a pretty good team you got yourself a really good team a connected team a team that understands and can react to what is happening and can recognize you know uh whether it's a missed assignment or recognize things that they see on tape faster than perhaps they would instead of just watching your position group you're watching everybody you know how this affects so I, I think I think this team right now it's a great start collective effort complimentary football like we were talking about off the right. top that really has been the theme for me th through two weeks complimentary football all right Justin Jefferson left today's game with a quad contusion is what the word was from Head coach Kevin O'Connell after the game will see what they find tomorrow when they bring him back in to look it over. But I think one good sign was that Jefferson spoke after the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think he was feeling confident that, yeah, it's just a nasty bruise. I'll be able to get through this. Uh, what are you feeling right now? Are you concerned about Justin moving forward? Because you'll recall that he spoke before the whole season started. Mm -hmm about how he was worried about getting hurt again this year now that he had suffered an injury for the first time in his career that actually took him off the field. I think you have to worry about how deep the bruise is, but at, at the same time, too, if it's, if it's just a bruise, depends on the severity of the bruise. Maybe he sits out of practice Wednesday and Thursday and then gets 
upgraded to limited on Friday. Do, does does Justin Jefferson really need to practice no. for us to feel okay about it? If he doesn't practice Wednesday, Thursday, and then doesn't practice again on Friday, then we know we a red flag is going to be going up. But he, I think you said it perfectly. It's a good indication when a player is able to speak after the game and, and goes out of his way to speak to the media after the game. He even said it after the game that, you know, he, he felt like if it was a closer game at the time, he probably would have tried to give it a go and go back in. But at the state of where the game was at at that point, you know, he, he thought probably to err on the side of caution. I think that was probably the smart move. I don't anticipate Justin Jefferson missing next week's game, but we'll see how his body reacts as the week progresses because sometimes – could have setbacks, but when I'm talking about a bruise, I don't really think I've ever heard of a bruise setback before in terms of a, I don't know, I'm no doctor. It might surprise some of you at home, but yes. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to be seeing a bruised setback for Justin Jefferson this week. All right. Uh, how much has the division race changed in your mind after two weeks? Now, we don't know the outcome of the Bears. We're taping this before mm -hmm. the Bears game. Yeah. Uh, they could be 2-0, and tied with the Vikings for first. But Detroit loses today. They've not looked like a team that's uh, picked to be a Super Bowl mm -hmm. yeah. uh, contender at this point. And yeah. Green Bay, with Jordan Love still on the shelf, did get it done today to pick up their first win. How much has this division changed from before the season started to today? Through two weeks, it seems like it's going to be a little bit of a tighter race than anticipated. I thought it was going to be a fairly tight race, but really only between With two With the Vikings teams. Uh, looking in the, on the race. The Vi yeah, the Vikings were not one of the two teams I had in mind being in a tight race toward the end of the season. But I, I, I'm not sure how much I, it really affects my thought on the rest of of how, or how the, the rest of the division is going to play out because we haven't seen any divisional games yet. So those obviously go a long way towards what's going to happen in the division by the end of the season. But I, I feel like from what I've been able to learn over the first two weeks of the season, that this Vikings team is not going to be a, a team that you roll over. It's not going to be a team that's going to go away. It's going to give you full 60 minutes of football, and you better be ready for it because if you're not, they can go out and do what they did today against the San Francisco 49ers. So I think that – yeah, it's funny they bring it – because Detroit Detroit didn't look – they had their moments in the opener against the Rams. Right. But they didn't look fully on, you know, on the same page in sometimes that game. Today against Tampa, I don't understand why they ballooned out to being an eight-point favorite in that game. Missed opportunity there for me, and I knew it, but I was smelling <laughs> something. But there was I, – I did not think that Detroit was – was – supposed to be that big of a favorite against Tampa Bay. They go out and lose the game at home against Tampa today, and the Bucs are now suddenly 2-0 instead of Detroit. So I, I, I definitely think it's going to be a tight race. When Jordan Love comes back for Green Bay, then things might start to get rolling a little bit more for Green Bay. That's though, why today was such a big right. win for the Correct. Packers. Yes. You got one yes. of those games where you don't have your quarterback yeah. in the win column yeah. versus what everybody thought was going to be an L. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a tight race the rest of the way. It's just... You know, which quarterback do you trust more? Do you trust Jared Goff more? Do you trust Jordan Love more? Does Caleb Williams start to figure it out a little bit more because he didn't have the strongest debut against Tennessee? Does Caleb Williams figure it out by midseason? Suddenly the Bears offense turns around and they become something that really needs to be taken seriously. Still a lot to be answered. We don't know that yet. Just All yet. right. Is Vegas going to be paying people that took the Vikings on the over for the win totals. I think it was six and a half, seven. Yeah. Do you think now that two are in the bank that that number is now in jeopardy? Uh, yes, I do think that number is in jeopardy. Uh, I, there's a long way to go. Injuries play a big role in the season, as everybody w well Absolutely. knows. Absolutely. But I do think that the Vikings have positioned themselves to be a team that, and we've seen a lot of this over the last few years, to certainly, at bare minimum, be a team in these one-score ball games, where it could be a flip of a flip of coin, one play here, one play there, could change the outcome of a game. The Vikings, I think, I, I thought that they would win seven games before the season. I had them at seven and ten before the season, so I would have taken the over anyway. But now that you're off to a two and zero start, it certainly feels like you're on the inside track of. Uh, really coming out on top on that that preseason play by Vegas, yeah. All right, I've been leading the conversation most of the time. Is there something you want to kick out there before I say sayonara to our listeners? I think the only other thing that we haven't mentioned at this point is Will Reichard hitting his first field goal of his NFL career, three for three on the day. Show, looked good, 
kicked the ball well today. That's something you're going to have. We've we've been through it here, oh, haven't yeah. we, Jim, uh, with, with kickers. Plenty of years of that. That's the only other thing I was going to point out. Will Reichard, three for three, credit to him, rookie kicker, got the job done when his team needed him, and it, it's all part of being complimentary, complete team. And I'm seeing complete football. It's not perfect football by any means. There's some things that definitely need to be cleaned up. Two Two turnovers in the red zone is a recipe for disaster for you. The Aaron Jones one really surprised me because he's a guy that you do not expect the ball to be coming out of. I forget on the broadcast they even said that was only his second fumble in the last couple of years. It's it's a guy that doesn't typically put the ball on the ground. It was just a great punch by Fred Fred Warner, a great play by an all-pro linebacker. But in the past, you know, if you turn the ball over twice in the red zone, that usually comes back to bite you. It did not happen today, thankfully, for the Vikings. But that's certainly one area that they're going to have to look at. Because remember last year, we were starting games where turnovers were happening on the first drive of every single game. It happened last week. They were able to survive. But that's uh, on the flip side of that, that's something where you say, hey, adversity has struck. But you know what? We're not going to let it affect us. We're going to get over it. And not only get over it, we're going to go win the game. That's happened twice already so far this year for the Vikings. Encouraging side. Well, then to flip it the other way, the Vikings did do that to San Francisco. They had the interception yep. on Purdy, and then boom, Humble. it was right in the end zone. Purdy I loses mean, the ball. That's as well. how you make mm-hmm. opponents pay yep. when you get a turnover like that. Yep. So, we thank you for staying with us. Uh, where can they find this? Go ahead. You get the uh, honors. A- anywhere you find your podcasts, uh, Apple, Apple Play, or what is it? iTunes, Spotify, uh, Spotify. Yeah, I think I think is iTunes even still a thing? I'm not even sure. I would also just <laughs> yeah, go to I think the it is. I think you can go to the Fox 9 YouTube page as well. That's really where you'll find us. All right. And so tomorrow on Fox Local 330. More reaction on the Vikings. Plus, we'll give you the highlights from Kevin O'Connell's Monday presser. So that'll be available to you. If you're watching this on Sunday, Vikings post game tonight, every Sunday night, 1035. Pete Bursich comes in a whole hour so Pete can really talk mm-hmm. and get his points across. So if you want to check us out there, and of course, uh, Twitter, the At news. The news Fox 9. You can also follow Fox 9 Sports at any time. All right, that'll do it for us. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next Sunday when the Vikings uh, finish off the Houston Texans. We'll put it up. Well, well, I'm not not predicting. I'm just saying we're we're positive. We're we're positive. We're we're not telling you. He's positive. I'm cautiously optimistic about that. And there's nothing for you to rip. This is two weeks in a row. I I only work with what the team gives me. That's all. (laughs) All right, that'll do it. Enough of us. See ya.